I'm going to go ahead and get started. Maybe we'll have a few more people trickle in. Um, I know that the snacks came a little late, so people might still be getting their coffee in. I hope all of you got a little something to eat um, and some coffee so you'll be ready. I'm going to try to speak slowly, though that is not my nature. Usually I get excited about things, and then I sort of go and fast forward. Um, and I do have you know, a lot to present. This is something that I think about a lot. This is my kind of passion project. Um, and so uh, I'm very excited to talk about this. Um, so I, uh, the, the name of the talk is Visual Diagnostics at Scale. Um, and the word scale here is used kind of in a few different ways. Um, so as we go through the talk, I hope that you'll kind of see um, a few different uh, interpretations of the word scale. Um, so it's in, in the sense of, uh, you know, what the human mind can do, what our computers can do, what Python can do, um, and what some open source packages can do as data sizes uh, vary in uh, size and complexity. <laughs> so, um, to introduce myself a little bit, um, my name is Rebecca uh, Bilbro. I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the United States, and I flew here for this conference. Uh, so I'm not just um, kind of in the area very often. But um, my job in D.C., I work at a, a digital media analytics company uh, called ICX Media. And what we do is we look through all of the things that people are saying on social media and try to pick out trends um, and spot, spot things before anybody else spots them. Um, and so it's a lot of natural language processing uh, type work. And I um, sort of specialize in uh, applied text analysis. I have an O'Reilly book uh, called Applied Text Analysis with Python, if any of you are interested um, in checking that out. Um, and the main thing that I'm going to be talking about today is Yellowbrick, um, Scikit Yellowbrick, which is a open source pure Python package uh, that is designed at uh, helping people make better choices about machine learning model selection and diagnostics using visualizations. Um, as sort of a uh, visceral checkpoint in the modeling process to know if you're kind of on the right path or if you've gone off course. Um, and so I'm going to be showing a little bit of yellow brick today, but just a very small part. In yesterday's um, lightning talks, I mentioned that we just um, pushed out our first major release of yellow brick, which is a big deal. It's, um, the project is three years old, and so getting to our first uh, version uh, 1.0 milestone was a big deal. Um, so if you have experimented with yellow brick before, um, I would encourage you to upgrade um, your yellow brick. You can uh, pip install it or conda install it, um, and it works on uh, you know all platforms. We have uh, coverage for all all platforms that I know of. If we don't, let let us know in the, in the bug issues. Um, so and then uh, my contact information is basically the same on all platforms, uh, just for maximal discoverability. So if you want to um, get in touch with me after the conference, um, Twitter, GitHub, LinkedIn is all Rebecca, at Rebecca Bilbro. Okay, so I currently work uh, with a lot of text data, um, but in, my, in the course of my career, I have worked with a lot of different kinds of data sets. Um, and so the first thing that I want to sort of um, kind of make a case for is that um, the problems of machine learning and scaling are very data set specific. I know that there is this sort of trend now towards black box tools where you kind of put your data in and magically it does machine learning for you and spits out an insight on the other side. Um, but my feeling is that, you know, from my experience working with a lot of different data sets and working with a lot of data domain experts, um, that, you know, it doesn't really make sense to have a, you know, one, you know, one tool to fit all kinds of data sets. 
Um, there's a lot of variation. And I wanted to sort of talk about a few of the data sets that I've worked with in my career um, to sort of explain that. So right now, um, on the kind of rightmost side, I, I deal a lot with sarcasm now, right? So when people are talking about trends, um, it's very difficult actually to detect whether or not they are genuinely uh, saying that they like something or if they are being sarcastic uh, about a trend that they think is lame, uh, that they don't think is cool. Like for instance, um, you know, two years ago, if somebody was like, I love blockchain, um, that doesn't necessarily mean the same thing as somebody saying, I love blockchain now, right? It's more, there's a higher probability that somebody saying that now is being a little bit sarcastic um, because of context. <clears throat> so uh, the data, you know, when you're trying to predict um, and classify for sarcasm, you know, the data sets that you might work with, that I work with, um, are small in some sense, right? They're maybe only 50,000 uh, instances, you know, 50,000 tweets, let's say, or 50,000 Facebook posts. Um, but the features, uh, it's extremely high dimensional, right? So you might have 5,000 different features, and when you're working with text data, the features are words, usually. Uh, they might also be emoji. Um, they might also be things like you know, whether or not somebody's capitalized a word, um, things like timestamps and stuff like that. But in, in the past, you know, before I came to this job, I worked with, um, I worked at, as part of, in part of the um, public sector in the United States, at both the um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is the agency um, in the Department of Labor in the US that tries to protect workers from being poisoned and harmed by their jobs. Um, and so in, the, in that kind of job, the data that you would get would be very different, right? It's generally not text data, it's frequently sensor data, you know, things that are measuring the amount of ammonia or toluene in the air at a nail salon to try to decide if the workers who are painting people's nails are being exposed to enough chemicals to actually harm them. Um, and in this case, you have maybe millions of instances, and they're streaming in, and you maybe only have a few features. Um, and so this is big data in a different sense, right? So that the text data is big because it's very high dimensional, even if you don't have very many rows. The sensor data is streaming in, so it's big in the sense of rows, uh, but maybe not in the dimensionality. Um, and then I've also worked with uh, a lot of categorical data working at the U.S. Commerce uh, Department with census type data sets. So looking at um, data about the U.S. population, um, you know, in this case, maybe you would have many features that are all categorical um, and maybe many rows that are describing people. And so all of this to say that, um, you know, I, I think that when you think about real kind of data sets, the real data sets that you probably all work with, you know, it's sort of intuitive that a black box solution for machine learning sort of isn't going to work. You know, we, we have to sort of build custom tools um, around each of these. Um, even the black box tools sort of suffer with these kinds of data sets uh, in terms of speed, right? Because what the black box tools try to do is essentially perform a massive grid search um, over many different features and many different hyperparameters and infer uh, the best combination. Um, but that, you know, doesn't sort of take into account uh, the complexity of having, you know, a lot of different features, um, the potential for things like covariance and noise and heteroscedasticity. Um, and here are some kind of benchmark experiments uh, that I did just to kind of uh, have a sense of, how, you know, how long uh, does it take before a typical scikit-learn model sort of starts to break down? Um, and so what you're looking at here is a heat map uh, for a logistic regression. And what we're looking at, the, the, um, the intensity of the color here is proportional to the fit time. Um, and so what we're looking at is a comparison of, as we scale the number of features and the number of instances, so features are like the columns, let's say, in our data set that describe our instances, and the instances 
are the rows, let's say. So as we increase the number of features from five columns to 50 columns, and as we increase the number of instances, the number of rows from 500 to 5 million, um, what happens to the fit time for a logistic regression? Well, some models scale very well. Um, logistic regression scales, uh, scales very well. So when we get to kind of, we, when we sort of max out um, in this grid, we're at you know, a, a model that takes about 10 seconds to fit. Not all models scale that well. Um, so this is a simple uh, multi-layer perceptron. And again, this is the scikit-learn implementation of MLP. Um, and uh, you know, what's nice about the scikit-learn implementation is that it constrains some of the hyperparameters so that you don't have to um, kind of define everything. Uh, but obviously, if you were going to do deep learning on a data set, you would probably switch to something like TensorFlow or PyTorch. Um, but this is just to kind of show that, you know, as we scale similarly as we uh, did with the logistic regression, um, you know, increasing the number of features, increasing the number of instances, um, we sort of max out here at something closer to six minutes in fit time. Um, for even, you know, even the uh, multi-layer perceptron model, though, is fairly simple. Um, and when we try to scale to something even more complex, like an SVM model, uh, we get much worse uh, performance. In fact, my machine didn't even <laughs> make it to the um, you know, max number of features and instances. Um, I had to kill the process. I tried it several times, and that, you know, after uh, you know, five or six hours of, of spinning, I, I let it die. Um, but this is just to, to show, like, the, the pain points of, of this kind of scaling your data and trying to do machine learning on data are, are really data set specific, right? It depends a lot on how many features you have, how many rows you have. Big data, you know, doesn't just mean a lot of rows or streaming. It could mean a lot of features, a lot of columns, um, like text data or image data or video data. <clears throat> so, what do we do about this problem? Um, and essentially, I think there are really only four solutions. Um, you can be patient and just let it run for a really long time. Um, you can be wrong, by which I mean you can relax your, uh, your qualifications and be willing to have a lower F1 score, let's say, um, in order to have a model that fits faster. So you can kind of be willing to, to have your model be a little more wrong uh, in exchange for a faster, uh, faster answer. You can be rich, um, so you can just throw money at the problem and put everything in the cloud and have all the cloud running your problem and running that big, massive grid search. And you know, that, that actually is the solution that, that some companies use. Um, but what I would propose uh, and what I hope that you will walk away from this talk uh, believing is that the superior choice is probably to do steering. Um, so uh, that is sort of what Yellow Brick is about. Yellow Brick is about steering uh, machine learning model selection uh, and diagnostics. And so here, you know, just to kind of show a little snapshot, um, I, I often, there are so many visualizers now in Yellow Brick that I often have a hard time explaining kind of what is it for? Like, is it just for classification? No. Is it just for regression? No. Is it for text data? It's also for text data. Is it just for um, models, or is it also for transformations? Uh, it's also for transformations, so you can use this to transform your data and do a projection and see um, if that transformation is going to help your data converge in some way um, or remove outliers in some way. So what I want to talk about a little bit is sort of the adventures that we've taken in trying to figure out how to make uh, these visualizations work uh, for a lot of different kinds of data. Um, so this is probably a uh, somewhat uh, banal kind of plot for many people. Who works, who does primarily regression machine learning? Okay, so it looks like maybe a third of you are maybe mostly doing regression problems. So. Um, so this is a residuals plot. Um, what we're looking at here is, uh, you know, essentially how wrong uh, was our model um, as we uh, increase the values. 
Uh, and so as we you know, were looking at kind of how the predicted values um, uh, change, and what we're hoping to see in a residuals plot is what? Right, we want it to be evenly spread and we want it to be completely random. What we don't want to see is any structure, because if we see structure, that means our model missed something, probably. Um, but the problem with when you have a lot of data points is that you can't see what's beneath uh, you know, the two colors, right? So we can differentiate the training points, which are these sort of orange colored points, and the test points, which are blue, but it's quite difficult to see what's underneath the dark blue points, so it's, it's actually hard to interpret if there is potentially some latent structure in there. Um, and so one of the kind of things, one of the simple things that we've tried to add to yellow brick is a little bit more information, right? So um, a little bit more information is actually, in this case, taking away information, right? So we take away some of the opacity in the points so that you can see you have semi-translucent points now and you're able to see if there's any potentially structure and it looks like this is indeed random and it is because it's a generated data set uh, with just like a certain amount of noise. Uh, but we also get what? But on the other side, we get a histogram um, that also gives us a way to kind of see what the distribution is, um, which gives us like one more clue that the, these residuals are indeed fairly random. Here's another example. So this is, um, you know, this is potentially, uh, you know, another plot that you've seen before. This is a parallel coordinates plot. And so what a parallel coordinates plot is trying to do is give us a sense of if there are features um, that uniquely characterize certain classes of our data, right? And so what we're seeing is along the x-axis different features, and what we're hoping to see is braids of activity. And so this is a, you know, a data set from the UCI machine learning repository on occupied and unoccupied rooms. Um, and what we want to, what we're hoping to see is that certain features cause uh, the, the lines to be all together, you know, kind of grouped up together. And if we can see those chords of activity um, for a single class or for a few of our classes, we have a good sense that there is a, uh, that this is a problem that's well suited for classification. Um, the problem is that with a traditional parallel coordinates plot, something like you might see in pandas, um, you can't actually see that because the features are not scaled. And so you can actually, uh, we've added standardization and we have a few different, you know, there are a few, few different ways to do standardization. So we've added standardization to um, yellow bricks so that you can actually uh, ensure that there's the scaling um, so you can actually detect a little bit better if there is the separability between your classes. The problem with that is, you know, the way that Matplotlib works and, and yellow brick is built um, on, uh, on Matplotlib, the problem is that it, it works by coloring each point, so it looks at the first row of your data and it plots that line, and then it looks at the second row and it plots that line, and it looks at the third row and it plots that line. And that's how that's how Matplotlib works, right? It, it works by plotting layers onto a canvas, right? Layer on top of layer on top of layer. Um, but if you have a lot of rows, it's going to be plotting for a long time, um, and you end up having, you know all of you know, having to go through every single row in order to generate the plot. So one of the other things we've done is we've uh, introduced a fast mode, um, which you can, you have this parameter where you can set fast equals true. And in this case, what you do is you group all of the points by their class first, and then you paint on the classes as one object on, uh, onto the plot. And so it's much faster. But you don't get that sort of same effect of points being, uh, you know, a lot of points being layered, layered on top of each other. You do get a significant um, speed improvement, though. You can see it's almost linear. Another thing that we have tried to do with yellow brick is um, engineer it in such a way that allows you to group uh, plots together. Um, so what we're looking at here is a class prediction error uh, for a random forest classifier over a hobbies corpus. And so this is a text uh, data set where you're trying to detect 
uh, the classes of different documents based on the words that appear in those documents. Um, and a class prediction error plot is similar to a confusion matrix where you're looking at, you know, for each class, um, where were you wrong and where, you know, what did your model think the class actually was. Um, but, you know, what you don't see from just the, that error report is kind of what is contributing to the error. And so you can actually combine the class prediction error report with the frequency distributions of the top tokens for the classes where you're the most wrong. And that can sort of help you start to see, um, you know, are there certain words that are adding so much noise that are making it diff difficult to differentiate the classes? So um, in the last couple of minutes here, I want to talk about some of the things, some of the problems here that we've encountered. Um, and these are kind of meaty problems. Um, they're important things to think about, I think, if you do machine learning um, you know, with, with data that is either big in terms of the dimensionality or in terms of the rows or, or both. Um, one is that um, you know, Yellowbrick is built on kind of assuming the scikit-learn API, which means it works out of the box with any scikit-learn estimator or transformer. And also it works with any library that has a scikit-learn-like uh, API. For example, Keras has one, so it works with Keras. Um, XGBoost has one, so it works with XGBoost. Um, so the, the sort of, what I think of as the genius of scikit-learn is really that you don't store the data on the object, right? There is no self.x, um, and it, there, there's a very good reason for that. It's because machine learning is actually not um, very, it's not a very good uh, uh, problem for object-oriented programming, right? It's not a smart way, uh, you know, out of the box to kind of do machine learning uh, with something like Python because uh, you, you, there's this sort of, you know, desire to, to store the data on the model so that you can then kind of diagnose uh, where things have gone wrong, uh, but that is not an efficient way to, to do machine learning. Um, so I think what's really special about scikit-learn is that they sort of figured out clever ways around storing all of that data on a single object. And we've had to try to figure out how to do the same thing, um, which is actually quite tricky with something like, which we saw with parallel coordinates, for instance, you know, every single data point ends up getting plotted on the plot, which means you are, in a sense, storing all of the data on the object. Um, and so we've had to come up with ways around that, for instance, using things like the fast parameter uh, to avoid that in cases where you have a lot of data. Um, I, another one of the things that we've sort of struggled with, uh, you know, is so when you build a visualizer object, um, we sort of think about that visualizer object as the model, right? So it wraps the scikit-learn um, estimator or transformer, um, but it is itself an estimator, and so it has a lot of other attributes other than the plot, right? It has uh, information about fit time. It has information about the score. Um, so it's not just a picture. It's all of the information that comes with the model. Um, but a lot of times what people really want, including Andy, um, is just a one-liner, something that's sort of convenient where you can just in one line sort of say, give me that, that residuals plot and I don't want to kind of think anymore about it. Um, and so one of the things that we've had to struggle with is balancing between people who are kind of using this in a teaching context. You know, Andy is using this to teach his students how to do machine learning and people like me who do this at work and need access to all of that other data, like the fit time, which is usually a big determiner about how long we'll let a model go. Um, so that's kind of a tricky thing. Our, our compromise is what we call one-liners, um, which wrap, you know, a full uh, fit, uh, fit predict um, sequence of a model um, inside the sort of one-liner uh, format. Another one of the kind of bumps that we've encountered is how to do unit testing for images. This came up in the maintainers uh, conversation yesterday. Uh, what you're looking at here are the diffs in the images that uh, for all of the CI tests that have failed, <laughs> or uh, not all of them, but a small subset of all of the CI tests that fail regularly. Um, and, and what happens is that different operating systems render the plots slightly differently. So when you compare the expected image with the actual image that's been generated, there's a slight difference, um, which can cause all kinds of problems in unit testing. And it also takes a very long time. 
Um, so just um, to end, I wanted to say a little bit about what's on our roadmap uh, for Yellow Brick for people who are interested in using it um, and or potentially interested in contributing. And also I have a bunch of Yellow Brick laptop stickers if anybody wants to come up at the end and get one. Um, but one of the things that we're thinking about in terms of scaling is this idea of brushing and filtering. Uh, so this is a radial visualization plot, which you can do in um, pandas, and you can also do in, in yellow brick. The problem is that it works really good if you only have a few features. Um, so this is similar to that parallel coordinates, except now it's wrapped around a unit circle, and you have your features evenly distributed around, and the, the features are pulling uh, the, the points in your data um, with respect to you know, their, uh, their, their scores or their, their values. Um, this does not scale very well for um, this does not scale very well for a lot of features. Obviously, you can fit infinitely many features around the circle, but it sort of stops being sensical. You can't really use this to decide if this is a well a problem that's well suited for classification. So, what we're thinking is you could add something that allows you to brush and filter, so you can you know remove a few features um, easily or kind of generate, kind of like randomly generate uh, a subset of the features and maybe have a bunch of small plots so you can sort of see if there are certain features that are, are very influential in classification. Um, another thing is looking at, uh, you know, taking versions of existing plots and doing slight variations that make it a little bit better for um, machine learning uh, type uh, problem answering. So, for example, our current uh, joint plot now doesn't do a very good job at binning uh, a lot of data. So, we're looking at things like Seaborn that I think do a lot of nice, like a, a much nicer job using things like Hexbin to, to bin large uh, quantities of data that are kind of co located. Um, we're also looking at uh, taking some of our visualizers that take a very long time that can be parallelized. Um, and refactoring them to use Joblub um, to, uh, to kind of speed things up. Um, and we're also uh, working on visual pipelines. Uh, so this would be very similar to the, the scikit-learn pipeline idea, uh, except that you would kind of define your pipeline and you would say, you know, first give me this rank, do, rank 2D um, plot to see if there's any relationships between pairwise relationships between features and then do, you know, render a prediction error and then give me my cross validation scores and you would define that pipeline and you would call essentially poof, which is our show method. You would call poof on the, the pipeline and it would give you the entire sort of story from the beginning to the end about, you know, what's in your data, how, how good your prediction is and what your cross validation scores is and you can do a, a few pipelines with different parameters and see how they're changing. So the main takeaway um, is that uh, you know, what you should be thinking about is that models are essentially aggregations of data. And so are visualizations, right? And so we should use visualizations to steer our model selection. And hopefully you'll use yellow brick to do it. <laughs> Thank you. How does Yellow Brick fit into other, a suite of other tools that kind of assist with model interpretability like Yellow Brick 5? Um, I, think that it, I think it's part of, you know, it's part of kind of an ecosystem of tools that are sort of rising up to say steering and like making informed decisions about machine learning is far superior than just kind of outsourcing your, your, your fit process to some company that's going to you know, pass you back a, a fitted model, but no real insight. So I think, um, you know, that interpretability ability part is very important. And Yellow Brick is really, I think, focused on interpretability for the 
the modeler, the person who is doing the machine learning, um, and less on kind of presenting to a, you know, a business audience. Some of the tools, I think, are more geared towards external audiences and helping other people understand you know, how the model works. Um, and some are more on the spectrum of being you know, interpretation for the, the human mind who's doing the work. Um, and so I've put Yellow Brick sort of on that side of the spectrum of the tools that are kind of there um, to help the, you know, the human who's doing the steering make better choices and understand kind of how they're, how they're doing. That's a good question. All right. Thank you. <laughs>